Hey guys, this is Mitch with Fine Point CGI, and today we're going to talk about how to do WebRTC with Nakama inside of Godot. So we're going to go through the process of setting up our Nakama connection. We're going to set up a small device-based login system with Nakama. We're going to set up a small matchmaking system. And we are going to go through the process of hooking up and creating a small character controller that we can use to move around our scene and shoot at uh, the other players in our game. And then finally, we're going to go out to DigitalOcean and we're going to use my DigitalOcean instance to actually host a web game and we are going to test our game on the web. So that's what I have in store for you guys today. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so the first thing we need to do is we need to set up our Docker instance. Now, if you don't have Docker installed, you can pull it from docker.com slash getting started. I have a link in the description where you could pull this down. Now, I already have it installed, but you just download it for Windows or for Linux or Mac right here. And once you have that, then you can just pull down a Docker Compose file and use that to compose your Nakama instance. So where we get a Docker Compose file, which is basically a file that tells Docker how to build your virtual machine that's housing your Nakama instance, okay? And if we come over to the Nakama website here under Heroic Labs, here, if I pull this down just a tiny bit so you guys can see it, um, you can see here, Heroic Labs, Docs, Nakama, Getting Started, Install Docker. Now I have this in the link in the description as well, so you can pull this down. If you come down here to running Nakama, you can see that they have a section here, docker-compose.yaml. If you basically just grab this little bit of code here and you copy it and you open up a new file somewhere. So in my case, I'm just going to open up my file explorer right here and I'll just go on my desktop and I will right click new text document and we'll name this docker-compose.yaml. And then we'll open this up inside of notepad and we will paste our Docker Compose data here, which is all of the data that we got from right here. And it's up to you on if you want to use Cockroach or Postgres. You can see they have one for both. But in my case, I'm just going to use the Cockroach database. It's a smaller database, a little bit easier to work with. So we'll go with that. Now I will hit Control S and I will come over here, go to my desktop and type CMD. And you'll see that we have our command prompt right here. Now I'm going to type docker compose up and that's going to create and pull down our Nakama and our cockroach DB containers and set it all up for us. So the nice thing about this is that we actually have Nakama installed without needing to go through the process of actually installing Nakama. The one of the nice things about docker is that it does a lot of the legwork for us and we don't actually have to do very much to make our installation of Nakama and have it all set up for us. So you see, it's gonna ask us to open up our firewall, say, yeah, we'll allow that. And you can see that we now have Nakama running in the command prompt here. Now, the easiest way to determine if we have Nakama running is if we come back to our web browser here and we type 127.0.0.1, colon, and we have to put in our, our Nakama port, which if you look at this Docker compose file right here, it is port 7351. And I just know that from experience, but 7351 is the default administration port for Nakama. So we'll say 7351 and we'll hit enter. And you'll see that we have the Nakama console. Now, if we type in the username admin and the password password and we log in and you'll see that it logs us in. So you can see that we have stuff like status, user management, configuration stuff. So we can actually edit our configuration in our user management. We can actually add new users, subtract users. We can put different people as different maintainers, developers or viewing. 
things like that. So this is for user management for the server itself. The configuration of the server, which is for the configuration of the server. Now, a lot of this is super useful for us because we could do stuff like, you know, our console port, our sign-in key, our data directory, stuff like that, which is super useful for our Nakama instance. Runtime modules, these are useful because it allows us to build our own modules in Go, Lua, and JavaScript. So we can actually code custom function in our Nakama instance. So for instance, if I needed something to validate in-app purchases, this would be a cool way to do that. You could say, well, when something comes in on this port, go ahead and put it into my database so that I can validate purchases. Accounts is all the accounts that the users have, and this will come you become useful when we start doing our uh, login and our authentication. So this is very useful. Groups is for user groups. So we can actually have like guilds and things like that. And we can actually see all the guilds and stuff like that that exist. So if we have a guild that's, you know, griefing people and causing a lot of problems, we could just come in and just delete them. And be like, you're gone. You're out of the, you know, you're out of the, your, your, your clan is now dead, right? Um, storage is really useful. One of these days I'll make a tutorial on it, but basically it's having a small database for your users so they can pull back different data and things like that. Leaderboards is really useful if you want to have leaderboards. So if you had like a time attack game or something like that, you could have a leaderboard for people to fight against each other on. Now I will make a tutorial on this and storage and groups and matches and a lot of other things, but right now we're just doing basic matchmaking stuff. Matches is allowing us to see the actual matches and what matches are currently running. Now we can't just like, we can't watch them play, but we can actually see how much data they're using and things like that. And that's really useful if you have a match that for some reason has been going on for, you know, six hours or seven hours, you know, that might be an indication that somebody is just hanging out in a match and have their computer running and that you might need to kick them off or something like that. API Explorer is useful because it allows us to actually send requests directly to our API via the console here. And the nice thing about that is it lets us test our API without needing to use something like Postman or anything like that. We can just test it directly here inside of our web browser. Heroic Cloud is something you will not use um, unless you pay for Nakama and unless you want to pay their extremely high prices for their hosting service, you'll probably never use this section here. Documentation is all the documentation. Forms will take you to the forms and the blog will take you to their blog. Simple enough. So now that we have this set up, let's move over to Godot and let's start setting up our login system. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is we need to pull down our add-ons. So we'll go up to asset lib and we'll come in here and we'll type Nakama. Now you'll see that you have a bunch of different add-ons. So the first one we need to pull down is the Nakama Godot client. So we'll grab that real quick and we'll click download. And that's going to install a bunch of Nakama stuff. Now. We don't want some of the stuff that's in here. There's a lot of extra stuff that we just plain don't need. So we will uncheck code gen. We'll uncheck the test suite. We don't need that. We don't need the GitHub or the Git ignore or the change log or license or readme. We just need the add on section and that's it. So we'll add that and install that. And the next add-on that we need to pull down is the WebRTC and Nakama add-on, which is created by DS Nopic, which is an awesome guy who uh, I believe has a tutorial on this as well. So you could actually look at his tutorial as well. Now, if we click on the add-on and we click download, one of the big struggles I have with this add-on is it has a bunch of extra stuff in it. So we're going to need to pull all that extra stuff out. So once this is completed, come up here, uncheck RES, come down here under auto load, check online. Underneath WebRTC, we need to check WebRTC and WebRTC debug. And the WebRTC and WebRTC debug is the Godot WebRTC and the Godot WebRTC debug libraries that we need to actually do WebRTC. 
The online is just some extra code that that Napic has created that has made it easier for us to integrate with Nakama. And then, of course, the WebRTC online match is the matchmaking stuff that he's created to make it easier for us to matchmake. So we'll click install. And there we go. So now that we have this, we need to create a login screen. Previously, in a previous version of this, um, I've had you guys create an actual login screen where you could type in a username and a password and you could register and things like that. Um, in this specific case, we're going to do a different type of registration and that is a device-based registration. Now you can do user login if you just use my previous tutorial as an example, you could basically just do a, a login system. But in this case, I thought it'd be fun to show off a simpler type of login system. So we'll go and click user interface. We will right click on our control node, add in a child node, and let's add in a control node. And we will call this control node matchmaking. And then we're going to right click, add in a child node, add in a panel. And we'll make that panel full rect so that way it matches the entire size of the panel we have here. Now we're going to make the panel about this big give or take and we're going to go to layout and go to center right here. And that's going to center it into our the middle of our screen. Now we will right click our matchmaking, add in a child node and let's add in a button and let's name the button start matchmaking. Then we're going to right click our matchmaking again, add in another child node and let's add in a rich text label. And let's place that somewhere in this general area, just like this. And we'll just say name colon, and then let's right click our matchmaking, add in another child node and let's add in a line edit, which will allow us to have the user able to put something in and we'll just kind of put it right here about this big give or take for the text we'll just say name and we'll grab our start matchmaking button we'll make it about this big drag it to about the center make it about yay big or so and type start match making i don't know if matchmaking has a space or maybe it doesn't i'm not sure so I guess we'll go with a space. I'm probably wrong. You guys can yell at me in the comments. And then we will come up to our control node. We're going to right click, attach a script, and we will call it main.gd. We're going to create that. Now, before we start coding, we're going to need to make some singletons. So we'll go up to our project, project settings, and go over to auto load. And what auto load is going to allow us to do, it's going to allow us to create a bunch of singletons that we can access throughout our entire project, which is super useful. So we'll come in here, we'll click on the little file icon, we'll go to auto load and we'll make online one of them, open it and then click add. Then we'll click on the file icon, we'll go up one, we'll go to add-ons, we'll go to Nakama WebRTC and we'll make online match another one. Then we'll go to file, go peel up one more time, go to heroic.com Nakama and grab our nakama.gd and we'll make that one as well. And that's gonna allow us to access our online match code, access our online code, which will allow us to interact with Nakama. And if we need to access Nakama directly, we can do it via Nakama as well. So we'll click close and we should be good to go to start coding. First, we have to connect to our Nakama instance, okay? We need to be able to authenticate and connect. Now, in a previous tutorial, I went through the process of setting up an actual connection via login, but this time we're going to go a little bit different. We're going to connect via device authentication. Now, if we come up to the top, much like before, we need to have some variables up here. First, we're going to need our Nakama client. So we'll say var client and we'll make that type Nakama client. Then we need to have our session. So we'll say var session. We'll make that a Nakama session. Then we need our socket. So we'll say var socket and we'll make that a Nakama socket. All right. And then basically, our client is us. Our session is our session with Nakama. 
And our socket is a socket that we're using to connect to our Nakama instance. Now, as with our previous one, we need a username. So we'll say var username, and we're going to make that default to just example. And that should be good for now. Now we're going to need additional things later, but right now that's what we'll have. Now we need to create our connection, okay? So when we click the button, we need to be able to connect to our Nakama instance. So we'll say func connect to Nakama. And we will say client is equal to our Nakama connection, right? So we'll say Nakama dot create underscore client and we need to pass in a key and in our case we're going to use a default key because the default key is going to make things a lot easier for us so we'll say default key comma and we need to pass in our ip address that we're using to connect so we will say in our case 127.0.0.1 that's our internal ip address to our nakama instance if we look at our docker container you can see that we have three containers that are running and one of them is our nakama instance here which means it's running at our 127 much like how we connected to our um, console we used 127 here we're going to need to use 127 as well next up is our port in our case it's 7350 and then I'm going to hit enter just to kind of help format this a little bit better. Then we need to tell it what our type of connection is. And in our case, it's going to be HTTP. Now you want this to be HTTPS, but for testing, HTTP is going to be fine. So we'll hit comma. Now we need to tell Nakama how long our timeout is going to be. And in our case, we're going to use something like three, which means, I believe it means three minutes. We'll hit comma and you'll see that we have an error here, expected comma. That's because I forgot to put a comma at the end of this. So we'll hit a comma and then up here we'll type nakama logger dot log level dot error and that will give us our log level of error. Now you're going to see that we have some uh, issues here. It says it cannot fully load singleton script nakama. This is a common problem with the Nakama system. For some reason, it just displays this issue. Everything works. It's just an issue that it shows because it thinks that there's an issue with um, a cyclical reference somewhere, but it's not actually the case and everything runs normal. So just ignore that error for now. And unfortunately, I don't know if there's really an easy way to fix it. So next, we will create our device ID. So we'll say var ID is equal to OS dot get unique, unique ID. And the reason why we're getting our device ID is that is because we're doing a authenticate via device. And since we're doing that, we need to have a unique ID to go with every single person that's connecting with our system. So we want to pull our unique ID so that way we can register that with Nakama and that no two devices will be the same. Now we need to hook up our session. So we'll say session is equal to yield client dot authenticate device async. And we need to pass in our ID comma our username. And then we need to wait for the completed function. Now, completed just means that all the code has been ran and it successfully ran through, or at least that it just ran through. So since it doesn't tell us if it failed or not, we're going to need to check for that. So we'll say if session dot is underscore exception, then we need to print our session dot exception. And that'll basically just say, hey, something failed and here's what failed. So we'll say, actually, we'll quote, connection has failed and we'll just pass in our session exception. That way we can actually get a good, a good solid understanding of what our exception is. And then what we'll do is return for now. And if we want to, we could kill our tree just by doing get tree.quit if you guys want to. But in my case, I'm just going to return 
And that way it just says, hold on, something failed, right? Now, now that we know that this has succeeded, right? We haven't had any exceptions or else it would show up here. We need to open up our socket to Nakama. So we'll say socket is equal to Nakama dot create underscore socket underscore from our client. Then we need to wait for that socket connection to be established. So we'll say yield socket dot connect async our session comma and we're going to wait for a completed and that's basically just going to say hey we're going to use this session to create a socket okay so it's going to use the client information and the session data to connect our socket so we're basically saying hey here's our session here's our authentication we're good to go, Nakama. Let's just create a socket connection and allow us to do whatever it is that we need to do. So then we'll type print connected, and that will allow us to be connected. So now that we have this, let's hook up our button and our username code. So that way this all should work in theory. And if it does, we'll be able to check it on our internal server. So if we come over to our button start matchmaking let's come over here and say button down on button down let's connect that to our control node and you'll see it pops up right here and what we'll do is we will pull our username we'll set that and we'll connect to our nakama instance so we will say in our case i believe we called it username right here so we'll say username is equal to dollar sign username dot text and then we'll say connect to nakama and that will allow us to connect to our nakama instance now if we run this and you will see that we have an error invalid operand string and nakama exception to operator plus that's because we were supposed to put dot message and that should bring back a string let's try that and see what happens so we'll hit refresh there we go. Let's change our name to fine point CGI and let's start a matchmaking. And you will see that it says connected with an exclamation point. Perfect. We got no exceptions. We had our connection and everything seems to be working. So let's verify that it's working. So let's go over to our Nakama console. Let's go over to status. You'll see that we have one session. So that's good. We have one authenticated session. If we go to our accounts, you will see that we have fine point CGI right here, which is awesome. So our authentication works and our connection works, which is perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. So let's close our game. Let's go back to Godot and let's start coding out our matchmaking system. Once we're connected, we need to do our matchmaking code. So to start that, we should create a function to kind of set up our matchmaking uh, system. So we'll say bunk start matchmaking. And we're going to want to configure the online match code. So we'll say online match dot minimum players is equal to and we can set the number of players we want to wait for now in our case since we're just testing let's make sure it's just two for our maximum players we can say online match dot max players is equal to whatever number we would like in our case it's going to be four and i believe these are defaulted as well so if we go over to our online match code which should be under our add-ons nakama webrtc you can see it defaults to two and four so we don't necessarily need to specify these but i'm just going to specify them to abstract it out it'll make things a little easier for us in the future and then we could say online match dot client version and we're going to want to say dev and this is basically just saying whether or not we're in development or production Basically, it just determines the verbosity of the actual um, logs and things like that. Next, we need to specify our ICE servers. And an ICE server stands for 
interactive connectivity establishment server okay and basically that's a standard that is used for what's called a stun and a turn server okay and a stun server is used to create a connection between two systems and allow them to communicate to each other through their firewalls and a peer-to-peer -peer connection. So the nice thing is, is, is a stun server will allow you to connect directly between two systems once it's set up. Now a turn server, which is part of the ICE server system, a turn server is a bit different. A turn server allows you to pass data between each other through a server. So much like how Nakama currently works, you use a turn server to just relay that data between each other. And basically it creates kind of like a hub and spoke system, if that makes sense. So one client wants to send its data instead of it sending it directly to the client like a stun server would, Instead, it sends the data up to the server and then it sends it to the other client. So that's the big difference between a stun and a turn server. Enough about how it works. Let's go ahead and set it up here. So we'll say online match dot ice servers is equal to, and we need to provide a list of objects. So we'll pass in a list and we'll put a curly brace and we'll say quote URLs semicolon and then we need to pass in a list of URLs. And in this case, we are going to be using the Google stun server. So we'll hit quote stun colon stun dot one dot Google dot com colon 19302. Now this is a stun server that Google provides for free for you to use for your projects. Now, usually Google's pretty good about allowing you to use it forever for free, but do know that if you have lots and lots of data running through this stun server, you should probably host it yourself so that way you have more control over how the stun server works and how the security is set up. So this is mainly used for testing in like very small projects. So now we'll hit enter and we will set up our network relaying. So we'll say online match dot use network relay is equal to online match dot network relay dot and you can see we have a couple of options here auto forced and disabled so what this does is it sets whether or not you want to use a turn server or a stun server if you have forced it's going to use the turn server and if you have it as disabled, it's going to use the stun server. If you set it to auto, it's going to attempt to do a stun first, and then it will fall back on a turn server. So we'll do auto because auto is probably the best method here. So we'll set that. And then we can set up a bunch of signals and I can go through each one and what they mean and why they're useful. So we'll start off with online match dot connect and we have a bunch of signals here you can see we have a boatload of them to mess with so the first one we'll do is going to be disconnected comma self comma quote on online match disconnected and then we need to copy and paste this i'm going to say about 10 times or so because there's going to be a bunch of them. We can, of course, you know, add more, subtract more as we go. So on connected or on disconnected, on error, on match underscore created, on our match joined, on matchmaker match. On player underscore joined, on player underscore left, player underscore status underscore changed, match underscore ready, 
and finally match underscore not underscore ready now we will come in here and make this be the same across the board here so on match error and capital e and then we'll do this one next on match created on match joined on matchmaker matched on player joined on player left on online match player status changed on match ready and finally on match not ready now a lot of these we don't necessarily need but we're gonna have them just in case now next we need to set up our matchmaking to actually happen so we'll say online match dot start matchmaking and that's going to start our matchmaking now we need to pass in a socket connection to say hey online match tool we're going to use this socket to to connect this nakama socket to do our matchmaking so we'll pass in our socket just like that and that's pretty much it so the question is how can we test this well, Nopic created a small status message that says joined via matchmaker when we connect to each other. So we can actually just wait for that little um, command to show up or that little print statement to show up. So it should go over pretty well. Now, if I come down here, we'll set up a print real quick and just say it just to say started matchmaking that way we have some kind of you know words to help us know that we're actually matchmaking we can run this and attempt to use this but we're not going to be able to matchmake because we don't have a second client to connect with now we can come out here and export it and build it for windows or we can use a really cool add-on in the asset lib called multi run and multi run will allow us to run multiple versions of Godot at the same time. So if we click download and we install it, hit okay, you will see if we go up to our project, project settings, we go to our plugins and then we turn on our multi run that will add a nice little play button right here. So if we come up here and click on it, you will see that it's not going to do anything. Okay, it's going to just execute Godot. And the reason why is because we haven't defined a main scene. So let's select our main scene and let's select the main.tscn, hit open, and then it will allow us to run it. So now if we click on this, you'll see that we get two versions of Godot right here. And we can just set a name. So we'll say name, which is fine. We'll say start matchmaking and start matchmaking. And you will see that it says connected. So that's good. Let's see if it runs through our code. We might not be calling it. Let's see, start matchmaking. We are not starting it. So we will call that right here. So let's come in here, call that and close these guys. And let's try that again. So we'll run this through just like this. We'll hit start matchmaking, start matchmaking. You'll see we have started matchmaking right here. And if we let this sit, Let's see if anything good comes of it. We don't have any errors except for this connect node does not exist in play join, but I don't think that's that big of a deal. It should be okay. So let's see what happens if we go to our output. We do have an error. Method failed, returning, parsing, unknown. So it's attempting to call a signal. So something ran. It looks like it's running on matchmaker matched. It's running on player status changed, on player status changed, and on matchmaker match ready. So we did successfully run our stuff. We just need to create these signals. So let's come in here and create those signals real quick. And then let's see if that works. So you can see emit matchmaker matched, player status has changed. And then it says we had a connection, player status was changed, and the match was ready to go. So we need to make sure that we have our stuff set up properly. 
So let's come in here. Let's close our debugger and say funk. And our first one was, if I remember correctly, matchmaker matched, which would be on matchmaker match. So we'll copy that. We'll paste it just like that. Now, when a matchmaker matched happens, it's going to return back a list of players. So let's type players and let's just print our players. That way we have our players. Now, next, the next one was on status change. So let's come up here and let's grab our status changed right here. And if I remember correctly, this one returns the player and the status. So we'll pass in player comma status. And let's print that real quick. So print our player comma status. And that should just pass in our player and our status. And then it did a player status again. And then it did a match ready. So we'll grab our on match ready. So let's come down here. Funk on match ready and it will pass in a player's dictionary as well so we'll do that so we'll print our players just like that now if we run this and we test it real quick let's see if this works for us so we're going to start matchmaking twice you'll see it started matchmaking and you will see that we have started matchmaking we have our two player ids right here and our two references right here. And then it shows our two players connected. So we ran through, got our matchmaker matched. We got our status, which means both players are connected and ready to go. One means it's good to go. And we have our second set of players right here, which is the same two players. It's just saying that they're ready to go. So that's awesome. So we have our connection now running through and working, and we have our matchmaker working and connecting. All right, you guys can see the type of data that we're getting back here. If we look at our players and we go to our dictionary, we take a look at it. You can see we get a username, a session ID, and a peer ID. Now you can see that I have two usernames that are Finepoint CGI. That's fine, that's just because my uh, device ID is the same as my previous device ID. So we're gonna have the same username. That's just something that we're gonna have to deal with, at least in our testing. So now that we have our username and things like that, let's assign that username to a list of people up here. So we'll come up here and say var players is equal to a new object. And we'll come down here and we'll just assign that. So that way we have our players assigned to something. So we'll say players is equal to players. And I think I used a, I should probably use a capital P just to differentiate these guys. So we'll just do that. And then we will create our connecting screen. So let's come over to our control, right click that, add in a child node and let's add in a control node. And let's grab that and make it about this big ish, about the same size. And we will right click, add in a child node, and add in a rich text label. And let's center it just like that. And let's type connecting. And you will notice that this is very similar to my previous tutorial because I basically want it to be the same just with WebRTC. So now we'll grab this guy and say connecting screen. Now we're going to want our connecting screen below, below our matchmaking screen. So let's put that above our matchmaking screen and let's add a panel real quick as well. So that way our panel can you know match the size of our object. We'll come up to our layout and we'll go to full rect and that's going to make things a little bit better for us. Now, if we go back into our script and we scroll up, when we start our matchmaking, we're going to want to hide our matchmaking object. So we'll say dollar sign matchmaking dot hide, and that will hide that object. So when we click on it, 
it'll just go ahead and hide it for us. Now let's create our ready screen. So we'll right click our control node, add in a child node, add in another control node, drag it up to the top, click it and say ready screen. And we will right click it, add in a child node, add in a panel. We'll make that a full rect. And we'll grab it, drag it down here, just like so, and make it about yay big. We'll right click it, add in a child node, add in a panel, and we will go ahead and make that full rect. So that way we have our panel. If we hide these two guys, we can take a look at what we have. And now that we have our panel, we need to create a button to say that we're ready, right? So we'll right click our little ready screen here, add in a child node, let's add in a button. We're going to drag our button to be about this big, give or take, and we're gonna drag it down to the bottom and we'll just say ready with an exclamation point to make it more exciting. And now we need to display all of our users. And the only way to display all of our users is to have some kind of container to have all that data. So we'll right click our ready screen. We'll add in a child node and we're going to add in a V box container. And that's going to allow us to see our users as a list of people. And we're going to need to spawn those users underneath this object, but we can't just have them exist here we need to spawn them as its own scene so we'll right click our vbox container add in a child node add in a control node and we're going to name this user ready much like we did in the previous tutorial we'll right click our user ready add in a child node add in a rich text label and we'll put user name just like that. We'll make it about yay big, give or take. And then we're going to right click our user ready, add in another child node, add in another rich text node, and we'll put it over on the other side, which really we could use these layout controls that would help a lot. We can just kind of throw it down here like this, and that will help keep it pinned on either side. And we'll say not ready by default. And that will allow us to have that as a default so that way we don't have to input it. Now we're going to need to make sure that this control node is the correct size. In Godot 4 they've done some changes here that has made this a lot better but in this version of Godot unfortunately we have to do it kind of the older fashioned way. So we'll come into our rect, we'll change our main size, our min size y to something like 50 maybe or maybe 30. We'll say 50. I think 50 is a good number. Also, we're going to want to make sure that our layout is center left. That'll help keep everything set properly. And we should probably do the same thing with not ready center right. See if that lines it up. And that seems to have lined it up pretty well. So now we'll right click our user ready. And before we make this into a scene we'll grab our rich text label name it username and we'll grab our other rich te text label and type ready so that way we have those now we'll grab our our user ready control node here we're going to right click that and save branch as scene we'll save it as user ready and save now we can remove our user ready because we don't need it anymore and we can start actually coding this so we'll go to our control node and we will build it First, we need a reference to our scene. So we'll scroll up to the top and we'll make a reference to it. So we'll say export var ready user colon pack scene. And I should probably make this a capital R because this is going to be an exported var. It's going to be something that's going to be used outside of the scene or outside of the script. So I should probably do capital letters. And we're going to say equals to resource loader dot load and we'll pass in a path now this path can be any scene that we want it to be but in our case it's just going to be res colon slash slash and we have our user ready scene right here so user ready dot tsc n now we can come down to where our 
assignment of our players here is and we can say okay we know that we have our players now we just need to show those players on our ready screen so we'll say dollar sign connecting screen dot hide because we don't want to show that anymore and then for player in players dot values so for each player in our values, so it's going to grab back these guys, these values here, var ready user is equal to ready user dot instance. And then we'll need to set our user's name and our uh, user's information, right? But we can't just set it without having some kind of script to set it. So we are going to need to set that up with our ready users. So if we come over to our ready user scene, we right click on our scene and we attach a script and we just attach a user ready script here. If we come down here, we'll need to make a function to help with setting our user information. So we'll say func set user info and we'll just pass in the user name that the player is using. And we'll say dollar sign username dot text is equal to user. And then we should probably have a function to set our ready status. So that way when the user clicks on the ready button, it sets their status. So we'll say func set ready status and we'll pass in a status dollar sign ready dot text is equal to status and that should about do it for our user ready script so if we go back to our main we can just say ready user dot and we need can use our set user info so we'll just copy that set user info and we'll say player dot and if you look at our values here if we providing that it actually allows us to do it because i'm sure at this point we're way past our breakpoint I believe it's just, I believe it's username, but I'm not sure. So what I'll do is I'll throw a breakpoint here so we can test this and we'll go from there. So we'll click play and let's test this real quick. And we forgot to set our connecting screen and our matchmaking screen to on. So now that we've done that, let's hit play. Let's hit start matchmaking and start matchmaking. You'll see that A, we don't have our connection string, uh, screen, which is not good, but that's okay. Let's see if we get a good matchmake here. And we do have an error, it looks like. Oh, that's just non-existent signals, that's fine. And you'll see we have a breakpoint. Let's take a look. It's user name with a capital U, not a lowercase u, so that's my fault. So we'll say user name. And we will pass this down and it should work for us. If we look at our username, it says fine point CGI. So perfect. And then if we hit play, you will see that we have nothing here, which is always a good sign. And we have our code at least seems like it's kind of working. Now we have our stuff instancing, but we can't see it, right? And the reason why we can't see it is because we need to put it underneath our ready screen. Dollar sign ready screen dot vbox container dot add child and we'll pass in our ready user just like that. And that should make it so that the player can see the users that are on the screen. Now, something else that we should do is we should set the name of our player as our session ID. That's going to make things easier when we need to reference players and things like that. So let's do that real quick. So we'll say ready user dot name is equal to player dot session underscore ID. And that should about do it for us. So let's go and click play and let's see what this is going to do for us. So we'll hit start matchmaking and that's still broken. I'm going to have to figure out what's going on with that. That's because our panel was above that. So now we fix that. So that should get fixed this time around, but we'll see. So we got our breakpoint. Let's come down here. 
hit play. Let's let this run through. We do have a error enabled to get reference. And that's because this should be a lowercase u. I made a mistake on that. So let's try that again. And you can see our connecting is now working. And you can see that we have both of our players, fine point CGI and fine point CGI, and they are both not ready. So we have our stuff communicating and things are actually kind of working, right? Now we just need to have our ready function. So when you click on that little button, it needs to fire off a function to say, hey, I'm ready to play. And this is where remote sync functions come in handy. So we will come down here. We will come down here and we will type remote sync funk ready. We will pass in an ID, okay? And we will say, all right, I'm ready and I'm good to go. So first we'll change our specific ID to ready. So we'll say ready screen slash vbox container dot get node or null. We need to pass in a node path. Now, in this case, we just want to pass in our ID and we'll say dot. And if we go back to our user ready script, you'll see we have set ready status. So we will use that. And I believe that's a lowercase s set. So we'll pass that in and we will pass in quote ready just like that and that's going to set our status as ready on the screen now we need to also say hey we are ready we are good to go and what i'm going to do is i'm going to come up here and i'll copy my players and i'll just say ready players that way i have two instances here i have my players and my ready players that way it makes things easier when i'm doing my list compare I'll come down here and I'll say ready players dot append ID. That's going to append that ID into my ready player. So then because I'm appending it into my ready players, I can just check if my ready players dot size is equal to my players dot size. And then I know that all the players are ready. So then I can start my game. So I'll just say print start game. All right, now that we have this, we need a function to call this function. And since the user is clicking a button to do that, what we'll do is we'll come to our ready screen. We'll go to our button. We'll rename the button as ready button. And then we'll come over to our node. We'll click on button down. We'll go to our control node and say on ready button, button down. That's totally fine. And we'll say RPC because we're doing an RPC call quote ready. So what we're doing is we're RPC calling this ready function. The way RPCs work, I guess I should take a step back. So inside of Godot for multiplayer, we have remote we have remote sync and then we have master and we have puppet. Okay. And each one is different and each one is important. So you have remote, which means this function is only going to run on this client. You have remote sync, which means that this code will run on everyone. So when this function is called on any machine, it will run on every machine. This is useful if you need to synchronize data with everybody. For instance, like if a player is moving or if you're doing a ready for your game. Then you have master, which only runs on the server. And then you have puppet, which only runs on the puppet players. So the non server side code. Now, in my case, I'm just going to use remote sync and that's it. Now under RPC, what we're doing here is we're doing what's called a remote procedure call. So we're actually calling out to this function and we're synchronizing with everyone. Okay. And with RPC, we have RPC and RPC ID. 
RPC means I'm going to send it to everyone. RPC ID means I'm only going to send it to one person. And then there is also RPC unreliable and RPC ID unreliable or RPC. I think it's actually RPC uh, unreliable ID. And what that means is we are sending it as a UDP instead of a TCP. If you guys want a full conversation on the difference between UDP and TCP and what's important and what's not important, we can have that conversation. But basically, unreliable is generally faster, but it's unreliable. So you don't want it to go for any data that's important. So something like if a player is moving left or right, you could probably do RPC unreliable. It doesn't really matter if you happen to miss a packet when the user's moving, you know, five inches to the left. Let's say you're sending a packet for each inch. If you miss a packet for inch two, but suddenly they're at inch three, so you have that small little snap there, it's not going to cause a problem. So it's fine to be RPC unreliable. But if you're passing stuff like a player has died, or if you're passing something like the game is starting, then RPC would make more sense. So in our case, we're just going to use RPC. And we got to pass in a parameter if we want to, to actually call this function. Now, in our case, we only have one, which is our ID. So we'll pass in online match dot my session ID. And that's going to pass back our session ID. And that's going to allow us to make sure that we have a proper session ID for our player. So now if we get rid of our breakpoint here and we hit play, in theory, everything should work. So we'll hit start matchmaking, start matchmaking. Let's find our match. We'll click ready and you'll see that we have a crash non-existent function append in base dictionary. And I wonder if I should have made that a list instead of a dictionary. Yeah, I think I should make this a list instead of a dictionary. So we'll do that real quick. And we will refresh all of our code and let's try that again. And I will be right back. We'll hit ready and you'll see that ready has appeared and we'll hit ready and ready has appeared. So both players are ready. If we take a look at our output, you will see that we have start game. Perfect. So we've done everything correct up to this point. We have communication. We can now RPC call. We can now tell everybody that we're good to go. So let's create a small scene that we can use to do all of our gameplay. So we will come down here. We're going to come over to our scene, new scene. And then we will create a new 2D scene. We're going to just make this something very simple because right now we're just trying to get our communication working and we're just trying to make sure that our stuff loads properly. So we'll just grab this icon, we'll drag it in and drop it in. So that way we just have some kind of an icon. And then we're going to right click our node 2D and we'll add in a small button just like that. And we will expand it out to be about this big, give or take. And what we'll do is we'll click on our node 2D, we'll right click it, attach a script, and let's just call it Game Play Manager. And we'll hit enter because I do like my managers. And now we will come to our button. We're going to click on our button down. We're going to attach that to our node 2D and we'll just do an RPC call RPC. And our method is going to be test connection. And then we'll come up here to our function and we'll say funk remote sync funk test connection. And then we will go ahead and just print. We are connected. And that will be all this scene will do. And the idea, and we're going to save it as game play scene. Now, the idea behind this is just that we want to load a scene and then just see if we have connection real quick. Okay. And I'll do some explanation on, on how we can approach this in a good way. So we'll come back to our main.gd. We'll come over here and we'll load a scene. So we can load a scene by just typing get tree because we want to get our actual tree dot load change scene. 
and we'll pass in our path. So we'll say res colon slash slash and our scene name, which in our case is game play scene. So we'll type game play scene dot tscn and that will do it for us. So what this is going to do is it's going to say, hey, start game and it's going to tell everyone to load their scene. So now if we test this, if we hit play, we come over here and we hit start matchmaking, start matchmaking. And we hit ready and ready. You will notice that both sides have loaded their scenes. And if I click, we are connected. And if I click, we are connected. You can see right here, down here. So everything's connected and everything works. Now, something to keep in mind, we may want to add in a small check to make sure that both people are ready to go, okay? And the way that you would do this is pretty simple. What you would do is you would uh, create a class that's outside of this and just pass in your players to that and then you would want to pull that data and check to see if everyone's ready and everyone's loaded and everyone's happy but in our case we're just going to be passing our players so what i'll do is i will come down here i'm going to right click and add in a new script and we're going to call it game manager dot gd and this is going to be our game manager We'll come up to our project, we'll go to project settings, we'll go to auto load, we'll go to our path, and we will pick our game manager, which is right here. And we'll hit open, and then we will save that. So now what we can do is we can come down here, and before we load that scene, before we say, yep, we're good to go, we'll just say game manager dot players is equal to players. Now we could, instead of doing, and what we can do is we can take this players object here, copy it, open up our game manager here, and then just paste that in here just like that. And that's going to allow us to have all of our players as more of a global variable for us to access. So now we can come down to our main, we can come over here, get rid of our players, and you'll see that we're going to suddenly get some errors here. And we can come in here and say game manager dot players. And I'll just copy this because I'm sure there's a couple other ones right here. And is there any other ones that we have to worry about? Nope, we should be good. So we could just pass our game uh, players here across to our game manager. So now when we want to communicate data between two different scenes, we can just pass our data through our game manager. So we can go into our game play manager and we can technically print our players if we want to. So let's set up our gameplay scene just a little bit more. So we'll come over to our node 2D right here. We're going to right click on it and add in a child node. And we're going to add in a node 2D. We're going to right click that. We're going to add in another child node. We're going to add in a position 2D. And in my case, I'm only going to have a four player game. Now I can get rid of these two objects here. The icon and the button aren't needed anymore. So we'll grab that position 2D and we'll pull it over here just like this. We'll change its name to one and we'll hit enter and then we'll duplicate it. It'll auto rename it to two. I will duplicate it again. It renamed it to three for us. So we'll put it here and four we'll put four right here. I'll kind of drag these guys down, give us a little bit more space, but I think that'll work for what we need it for. So now we need to have somewhere to spawn our players. And I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna rename this to spawn player positions. And I'm gonna right click my node 2D and I'm going to add a child node and I'm gonna add in another node 2D. Now. This node 2D is where the actual players are going to be spawned under. So we will name that as players spawn under.
And basically, this is going to give us the position of where we're going to spawn our players. And this one is going to give us the actual place that they're going to be spawned. And up here at the top, we're just going to name this as Game Manager. And that'll just kind of help us round out our actual scene here. I'm going to hit Control S and we'll go into our script and we're going to start scripting a few things to help spawn our players and things like that. Now to spawn a player, we first need an actual player. So let's go build a player. I've already done this a few times, so I'm going to be very quick about it because we've done this quite a few times. So first I'm going to go up to scene, new scene. I'm going to create a 2D scene. I'm going to right click it. I'm going to rename it as player. I'm going to make it a icon sprite like that. I'm going to right click it, add in another player. We're going to add in a collision shape and I'm going to make that collision shape a cube just like this or a little rectangular square. And I'm going to make it the correct ish size for our project here. So we'll drag that in. I'm going to right click my player, change type to a kinematic body. I'm going to right click, add in a child node and add in a position 2D. This position 2D is where our bullet is going to be fired from. So we're making a small little, you know, shooting uh, game here. So I'll set that to something like 55, which is what we had it set to in our previous tutorial. I'm going to right click, add in a child node. I'm going to add in a, I, a tween object as well. And that should about do it for our player. So we're going to save that as a scene. We're going to right click our player and we will attach a script to it. We're going to call it player.gd. So now that we have our player kind of at least structurally built out, first, we're going to need quite a few uh, class variables up here. The first one being the first one being whether or not the it is player controlled. So we'll say export bool space var player controlled and we're going to equal that to by default to false just in case next we need to get our vector data so we'll say var vector and this is basically the trajectory that we are moving so we'll say vector 2.0 the next one is our look at vector and what this is going to do is it's basically the rotation that we're looking. Okay. Next, we need to have our bullet because when we click, we want to shoot stuff. So we'll say export var bullet and we will make that a packed scene just like that. Next, we have to have a signal of whether or not we died. So we'll say signal player has died. And I think that'll do it for right now. We can uh, come in and add in some of our lazy updating later, but in this case, we'll keep this for right now. Now we need to remove this and we need to do a physics process instead of our normal update process. So we'll go func underscore physics process delta. We'll say if player is controlled, then we need to start moving our players. So we'll say vector is equal to vector two, just like that. And we need to make it so we can move up, down, left, and right, right? So we'll say if input dot is action pressed, UI down, then we're gonna wanna move down. So we'll say vector dot Y plus equals one. Then we can say if input dot is. And with this, we could basically just copy and paste it. So we'll just copy, enter, backspace, tab, paste it in just like that. And we'll say UI up, UI right, and UI left, just like that. And we'll say for up, we'll say minus one. For right, we'll say plus one and we'll put it on X. And for left, we will say minus one, just like that. And now we have to move our players. So we'll say vector is equal to move and slide vector multiplied by a hundred because we want it to move by our vector value multiplied by a hundred speed. 
And we need to tell it which way is up. So we'll say vector two dot up. Simple enough. Now we need the object to look at wherever the mouse is for the player. So we'll say look at and we'll get our global mouse position just like that. Now this will basically allow our characters to move left, right, and to look around, which is perfect. We'll get into shooting and things like that in a bit, but at least we have this. Now, since we're relaying all of the data through our um, server, we don't want the code to be called by the server itself, okay? So think of it kind of like, I don't want myself to call it, I just want everyone else to call it, okay? So what we have to do is we have to say puppet bunk update remote players and we'll pass in the current position and current rotation. And then that will allow us to update our data set here. So we can set our position equal to current position and our rotation equal to our current rotation. And that'll allow us to have a updated remote movement system, if that makes sense. Now, if we come up here, we need to call that function. So we'll say RPC quote, update remote players, and we need to pass in our position and our rotation, just like that. There we go. And that will allow us to update our players. Now let's set up spawning our players. So we will go back to our gameplay scene here. We'll go back to our gameplay manager and under our test connection, since we don't really wanna do a test connection anymore, we just want it so that it spawns our players. Let's get rid of all of this and delete it. And underneath our ready, Let's set up our game. So we will say set up game and we'll just take that as a function. And then we'll come down here and we'll create a small function. So we'll say func set up game. And then we're gonna run through the logic to spawn our players. So we'll say for ID in game manager dot players. We want to take that group of players that we got from our game manager and we want to run through instance a player, set its name, add it as a child, and then set its network master to our player ID. So first we need to instance our player. So we'll say var current player is equal to and we need to have some kind of reference to what the player scene is to instance it. So we'll come up here and we'll create an instance. So we'll say export var player as a packed scene. And then we can come down here and we can use that reference. So we'll say player.instance. And there we go. Now, when we instance our player, we want to have a unique name for that player. So we don't want it to just be player one and player two, because that can make things complicated. So instead we're going to use its actual ID for that player. So we'll say current player dot name is equal to str ID. And we want to make sure that it's a string. So I'm going to make sure that we force it to be a string just so that Godot doesn't get confused or get upset about our name. Because sometimes Godot can get upset because the typing is weird in Godot. So we will do that. Next, we need to put it underneath our spawn under. So we'll say dollar sign spawn under dot add child. And we will add our current player as a child. Now we need to set its network master because we need to tell it, hey, um, I am the network master or somebody else is the network master. This can be very useful when you want to determine if you're the network master or not. So we'll say current 
player.setNetworkMaster, and we'll say game manager dot players and we'll pass in our id to get back our specific player dot peer underscore id and that's going to pass back its unique network key now this can be useful if you need a unique network key for your player now generally you're not going to use it but it's just nice to have just in case next we're going to set its position so current player dot position is equal to get node and we need to pass in our player spawn positions slash plus str game manager id dot peer underscore id dot position now you can get this the way that we did before where you do um dollar sign spawn player positions dot get node plus str and you could do it that way as well i wanted to show you how to do it both different ways so that way you can choose which one feels better for you we have our players instancing now we just need to set our id and our player information so we'll hit backspace and we'll say var my id is equal to online match dot get my session id and that'll pull back our unique key and we'll put in var player is equal to dollar sign players spawn under dot get node str my id and that will get back our player now you can see i did it one way here and I did it one way here. And it's up to you on which one you guys like better. Some people like this method. Some people like this method. Next, we have to say that we are controlling that player. So we'll put player dot player controlled. If I remember correctly, it's player controlled. Let's check our player script real quick. Player controlled. It is. So we'll go back. Player controlled is equal to true and that's going to set that as our controlled player next we need to notify our server that we are completed and when you do that inside of godot you need to have a separate function for it called a master function so we'll come in here and we'll say master sync funk finished setup and that's going to allow us to say, hey, this ID has finished setting up and only the master can get this RPC. That's why it says master sync is only the master thing. The server can actually run this function. And inside of here, we're going to allow us to keep track of who's ready to play. Now, if we come up to the top, let's add a small variable up here called ready players just like that and we'll create a small object and we can come down here and say ready players pass in my id is equal to game manager dot players and we'll pass in my id and that basically just says hey this player is ready to go and now we can check if ready players dot size is equal to game manager dot players dot size then we can start our game and we'll just put start game all players are ready now in this case this is where you would allow people to move and allow people to do things and we'll cover that in a second but this should cover the majority of our stuff. Now we need to call this function for it to work. So we'll come up here and we will put RPC underscore ID. Now this is new to us. We haven't talked about RPC ID, but basically RPC ID allows you to specify an ID and say, hey, this specific machine run this code. Okay. And in this case, we want the server to run the code. So we'll type one, which is the server's ID, comma, quote, finished setup, 
comma, and we can pass in any parameters we want. And in this case, we only want one, which is my ID. There we go. So now if everything's been done correctly, we should at least have some kind of a game on our hands. So we'll come over to game manager and you'll see that our script variable is empty. So we'll drag our player into here, just like that. Let me make sure that our player script is good to go. Let's make sure that everything feels good. I think, I think that will work. So we'll hit control S and we will hit play. Let's try connecting these two guys together. Just like this. Let's let that run through and I will be right back. We will hit ready on both screens and you will notice that it seems like nothing worked, which is unfortunate, but always how it goes. You'll see invalid get index this on base node. Well, first we're grabbing our game manager ID, pure ID. That doesn't quite work, so that's my fault. So we need to grab our game manager dot, and I believe it's under players ID, not our actual ID. That's my fault. So let's try that again. I'm going to be right back. It's going to take a second for me to run through all of these tests again. So let me jump back and I'll see you guys in a second. And you can see we have both of our players. So now if I hit left and right, which I think actually my left is making me go up, which is always a good sign. So that's my mistake in the code, but our player actually moves around, which is awesome. And if we go to the other guy, you can see that he also can move. If I click on him and I move him and we move this into a space that we can actually see, he also moves, which is awesome. So we have our code actually working. Now, first we have that error we have to fix. So I'll come over to my player, come here, UI left instead of Y vector, let's do an X vector minus one, and that'll fix that issue. And next, we can set it up so that our players don't take up as much data. Now, you don't see it with a uh, local play, but in the past, Godot runs at about 120 frames per second on its physics frame. So when you're playing the game, a lot of times you are sending this code every 120 times per second and with four players that's not that big of a deal but with five players or or 10 players the game's gonna get really slow extremely quickly especially if people don't have good internet so let's first fix that and then let's add in the ability to shoot bullets and i think that will be where we will leave it so, so instead of updating every frame, we're going to count our frames and then update it only every X frames. So if we scroll up to the top, we'll add a variable in here called var update frames. We'll make that equal to about six and six is a pretty good number for me. And I'll explain to you why in a second, but Next, we'll add another one called current frames. And we'll make that equal to zero. Now, if we scroll down here, if player is controlled, then we want to increment our update frame. So think of it kind of like this. We are going to move our player. We're going to look at our stuff. And before we RPC our fire, we're going to check if our update frames is equal to our current frames. And if it is, then we will update our RPC. This means that we need to increment our update frames, right? So we'll say current frames plus equals one. And then we're gonna need to reset this at the end because we don't want it to um, keep updating forever. So we will set current frames equal to zero now that we've sent our update we should set this to less than actually because if we set it to greater than or if we set it to equals then it, it there may be a possibility we could have a problem 
Now, if we test this real quick and I will jump straight to the testing, you will see that suddenly our game is very, very laggy on our other side. And the reason why is because we're only sending an update once every frame rate divided by six because we're checking every sixth frame. So if you think about the math on that, I think that's would be 20 times a second, which is not a bad update. Some MMOs do as low as six frames per second. So it's up to you on what you want to set it to. You could set it to, you know, seven or eight or 10 if you want to. And that's really going to chunk your frame rate down. So if you think about it, if you do 10 at 120 FPS, that's going to be 12 frames. If you were to do it every 20, that would be every six frames. So it's really up to you on how you want to do it. But now we have this huge problem where it's super laggy when the player is moving around, right? And I know what you're thinking, well, how am I going to get some nice, smooth movement out of my game? Well, the easiest way is to use tweening. Now, we have a tween right here. Now, we're going to need two of them, so we'll need to duplicate this. But we do have a tween here. So if we copy this guy and duplicate him, just like that, we come down to our update remote players Instead of doing position is equal to current position, instead, if we do dollar sign tween dot interpolate property self comma quote position comma and we get our global position just like that and then we set it to our current position just like this and we set something small like 0.1 and then we do a tween trans linear, just like that. That's going to allow it to interpolate between those properties. And then we need to start our tween. So we'll go dollar sign tween dot start, just like that. And now we're going to do the same thing, but with I with uh, tween number two. So we'll put those guys in just like this tween two. And instead of position, we'll do rotation. And we'll pass in our rotation. And we'll pass in our current rotation. So how this works, if I pull this over a lot more, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of screen real estate here. If I look at this, you'll see it says self rotation. This is our current rotation. And this is the rotation we're rotating it to. I know the, the terminology here is a little weird, but that's the case. The next one is setting the time the amount of time it's going to take for it to complete. And then this one here is the type of transition it's going to do. In this case, it's going to do a linear transition because I don't want anything fancy. I just want it to translate the object. And it, we need to get rid of these two guys. So we'll get rid of that. Now, if we test this and you click ready and you click ready, you'll notice that it moves. It's just a little bit on the laggier side. So you can see it's nice and smooth and it updates like you would expect and it feels pretty decent for what it's worth. So that's not too shabby. Now that we have our moving and our uh, tweening system done, let's go and make our bullet. So we will come up to our scene right here. We're going to click new scene and we will come over here and make a new 2D scene. We're going to click on that and type bullet and we'll just change that name. I'm going to right click that and change its type over to a area 2D. And then we're going to drag in our icon here and we're just going to use the um, standard Godot icon. That's usually my go-to when I'm making uh, some test code. And I'm just going to scale this down to be something nice and thin, just like that, something nice and tiny. And then let's kind of drag this guy in. Now we're also going to want to make it a little bit smaller. So we'll just kind of scale this in as well. Something about this big give or take, I think will work. And since when we spawn, this is going to spawn at the center. We're going to want to pull this forward. So that way it's just slightly forward. So when you shoot it, it's going to shoot from right here and we don't want it to collide with our player. So we'll have it shoot like this. And then we need to make collision 
And then we need a collision shape to give this thing some kind of collision. So we'll right click our bullet and we will come in and add a child node and add in a collision shape, just like that. We'll come in here and we will put in a rectangular shape and let's size this to match our bullets size. So we'll make it about this big give or take. I think that will work. And now that we have this, let's right click our bullet attach a script and attach a bullet.gd to it. Now, while we're at it, we might as well set up our on bullet entered. So we'll come up to our area 2D, go over to our node and do on body entered body, right click that and connect that. And we're gonna connect a quick little um, signal to it. So we'll click connect and that will do it for this. So we're gonna jump into our code and first we need to make it so the bullet moves okay so we'll come into our process here and instead of doing a regular process we're going to do a physics process everything in our game has been physics process up to this point we should probably just keep it that way so we'll put that in physics process and we need to make it move to the right basically forever so we'll say position plus equals transform dot x multiplied by and in our case we can just drop in some kind of speed value or if we feel like it we can put it up here now in my case i'm just going to set this to 750 and then we'll multiply that by delta and that's going to allow it to lerp and that's going to allow it to lerp to the right at a constant speed if they miss their shot we don't want the shot to exist forever we want the shot to only exist for a little bit so instead of just letting it exist we should create a time to live so if we come up to the top and we say var time to live and we'll make that equal to about 100 seconds which is way too long okay but that will work if we come down here and we say time to live minus equals delta. And then we say, if time to live is less than zero, then we could just queue free. And what this will do is it'll make it so as the bullet travels, it'll disappear if it gets past 100 seconds. Now, you could probably have this at 60 seconds or maybe even 30 seconds. And really, if a bullet doesn't hit something within 30 seconds odds are it's gone right it's it's out of the scene but i'm just going to put it at 100 because that's just a really long number just in case now the next thing we have to look at is what happens if we hit something if we hit a player right well first we need to say did we hit a player did we hit a myself like what happened right? Because we don't want to hurt the player. If I walk into my own bullet, somehow, let's say some lag happens or something like that. We don't want to allow for that. So we're going to need to know who shot, right? So we'll come up here and we'll say var player who shot, and we'll just leave that as an empty string real quick. And then we'll come down here and we'll say, if body dot name does not equal player who shot, then we can say, hey, let's you know kill our character, right? But we don't necessarily want this because we need to make our stuff a server-centric system, okay? So think of it kind of like this. If you have two clients and one client, or if you have, let's say three clients, it's easier if you have, say, three. If we have three clients and on client number three, somehow there was some lag and the player hit a bullet by accident now that player is dead and it's going to send out an rpc saying hey you died but everyone else the player still technically lives and then suddenly the player just disappears right oh he died but that's not exactly fair if that makes sense so we should make it server centric right and say if it hits on the server then it's good to go. If it hits on the whoever is hosting the game, then you're good to go. So we'll put is, if is network master, then we can tell ourselves to die. 
Now we don't actually have a function for die, but I'm going to just lay the groundwork here for it. So we'll just say body.rpc and we will say die. And that'll basically be all we need. So I'm gonna hit control S and I'm gonna save that as bullet.tscn. And we will come over to our player here where we are going to need to add all sorts of stuff. So we will come down here and let's first make it so that our player can die. So we'll put remote sync bunk die. There we go. And you will see that I actually have a signal right here. Player has died. So first we're going to emit our signal. Player has died. And then we're going to queue free just like that. So we're going to emit a signal saying, Hey, we've, we've died. And then we will queue free. So that way we have now disappeared. Now let's make it so that we can actually shoot at other people. So we'll scroll up here to our if inputs and we will say, let's see right here. We'll say if input dot is action just pressed and I'm going to say shoot. Now I don't actually have an action called shoot, but I will have to make one. So we'll do that in one second. So when we shoot, we need to tell our project that we are shooting, right? So we could just put our code here, but it's best if we put it in a function. So that way we can call it from our puppet functions. So we'll say func shoot, shoot position and player who shot. There we go. Now we need to first instance our bullets. So we'll say var bullet and I'm going to say equals and we actually have a pack scene here. I've already put that in here. So we'll put bullet dot instance. Now you'll see that it's saying if this, so we'll just kind of pass that real quick. So that way we have, you know, auto completion. Then we need to add that child. So we've got our bullet instancing. Now we need to add that as a child. So we'll say get tree dot get nodes in group. And we'll need to get our game world. Now, the reason why I'm going to use get nodes in group instead of some other method is just because get nodes in group has always been consistent for me. So I'm going to come over to my gameplay scene. I'm going to come to my game manager and I'm going to attach it to a group and I'm going to make it game world and i'm going to copy that that way i just have a consistent this is my game world this is this the base of my world and then i'll come to my player and i will say quote game world i'll get back my first instance dot add child we'll make the bullet a child of our game world and now i'm going to say bullet dot transform is equal to shoot position. And that'll basically give us a nice function that we can use to shoot at any time. Now, if we come up here, we can just say shoot dollar sign position 2D dot global transform comma and our own name because that's our player who shot. And actually I'm not setting my player who shot. So actually we should say bullet dot if I remember correctly, it was player who shot right here. So we'll pass that in player who shot is equal to player who shot. And that will basically set our player who shot. So that way we can't hit ourselves. Now we have our shooting working here, but we need to also tell our RPC if we've shot, because if we do this right now, what's going to happen is just the person that shoots will shoot on their screen, but it won't shoot on anyone else's screen. So we need to update everyone and tell everybody that we've shot. So if we come up here, we can say var shooting is equal to false. And if they shoot, shooting is equal to true. And then we can just pass in our shooting right here. And we'll come down here and pass in a shooting parameter. And then we can come in here and say, if shooting, then shoot. And we can pass in our shoot position, which we don't actually have. So we're going to need to get that. And we're going to need to pass in player who shot. So you'll notice that we have to actually pass that in up here as well, right? So we'll have to pass in shoot pause and 
player who shot. And that means that we have to come up here and put in that data as well. So dollar sign position 2D dot global transform comma name. That way we can be guaranteed that we know who's shooting. And then we could just pass in shoot position and player who shot. And that will allow us to shoot in an RPC. Now this isn't going to work and I'll show you why. And you'll understand, it'll give you a little bit more understanding of how you have to code your own character controller. Now this isn't gonna fully work and I'll show you why. But before we test this, we need to create our shoot action. So let's come up to our project, project settings, go to our input map and add in shoot. I believe it's shoot with a lowercase s. So let's say shoot, add, and then we're going to make that a mouse button and we'll make it the left mouse button. All right, now I'm gonna run this and I'll show you why this isn't gonna work fully. So we'll run it. And you will see we have a crash here. It looks like I forgot to put my bullet instance. So if we go to player, go to our inspector and we put in our bullet.tscn and then we click run one more time and let's test this again and see if this works. So you will see as I shoot, he's not actually shooting. But if I click this a lot, you'll notice that sometimes a bullet gets shot. We'll need to update our code to basically make that is shooting a global variable. And we may need to even circumvent half of our code so that it shoots immediately. Just kind of depends on if this works or not. So we'll click close, we'll click close. We'll go back to our player script and we're going to grab our shooting var and we will just drag it right up at the top, just like this, and we'll paste it. And then we're going to need to set our shooting as false after we've had a shot. So if we've updated, shooting becomes false. So now let's test that real quick and let's see if that fixes our problem. And the reason why I wanted to show you guys this was because a lot of times I've had people have issues with it and they've said, hey, like my code's not working across the network. And for some reason it's only shooting once in a while or the updates only happening once in a while. And a lot of times it's because you're not keeping in mind that everything runs on a set frame rate. So you need to keep those variables until you've sent over your new state. So let's click ready, ready, and let's see what happens. And you will see that he now shoots on a more consistent basis. Now, is it quite the same consistency? You can tell that it's not quite the same consistency. So what can we do to fix that? Well, what we can do to fix this is to force it to RPC immediately. So if we come down here, instead of doing this section here, which is what a lot of people do, instead we can come over here and we can say RPC shoot, and then we can pass in our parameters just like this. And because this is an RPC, we're going to need to make this a synchronization function. So we can just say, remote sync function, just like that. And now we should be able to test this. And you will see for every click, we get an RPC call, so it's instant. So that's how you can solve when you wanna shoot bullets at people and it's not coming out properly. You can either A, increase your frame rate up here, your frame send overs. You can set a global variable to fire at the end of frame, but then you might miss a few or you can RPC that data across immediately. And it really depends on your use case and how much packets you wanna send over the network. If it's a small game, I wouldn't worry about sending lots of packets, but if it's a larger game, you know, sometimes you wanna batch packets and you wanna, you know, make some adjustments here or there. I know I've seen some larger game companies do some really crazy trickery with how they handle shooting. So, you know, those are two really good methods to make sure that your stuff stays in sync. So now we kind of have a game here. You can move around, you can shoot each other, and you're pretty much good to go, right? Now, the next big thing that we have to do is we need to set this up so that this works out on the internet. So we need to host Nakama on the internet. Now, I already have a tutorial on how to do that. 
and I can leave a link to it in the description below so you guys can take a look at it. It's actually a specific timestamp of my Nakama tutorial that I did, uh, I think about a month ago. So you guys can just follow that and that'll let you set all of this up individually. Now, for the sake of this tutorial and for the previous tutorial, I actually have a DigitalOcean server set up for us to use. Now, you guys are welcome to use this for your own stuff and to test your own stuff on it. And you can use it to play games with your friends and, and kind of test your stuff. So that way you can just see if your, your code actually works. Now, I do have an affiliate link to DigitalOcean. If you guys choose to host your own, you guys can just use that link. And I don't get any money out of the deal, but they do give me free server time if you guys use my link. So you guys don't have to by any means. I just put it down there so you guys could. Now, in my case, my... IP address to my digital ocean is 204-4828-159. And again, you guys can use that for your Nakama instances. So if we come back to Godot here and we go back to our main.gd and we scroll down here, you'll see that we have our IP address right here. Now default, I have our key as default key. And I also have our key as default key on the online server. So you guys can just use that to authenticate. Now we'll need to change this IP address to 204.48.28.159. Now I do have this in the description for you guys to check out as well. So how can we test this? Well, we just click the little play button and we hit start matchmaking just like that. And it should pick up my device ID from earlier. So you might see a, like a test username or you might see something else. You might just see name, it's possible. Um, but the nice thing about this is if done correctly, this should work. You will see in our Nakama console, we have two sessions, two presents, and we have very little data going through our system. Now, I will show you guys once the matchmaking is completed and we're actually playing a game and we're actually doing our thing. So you'll see we have both guys. They are running through our online Nakama instance. You'll see that we have two sessions, four presents. You'll see that our data rate is basically non-existent. And that's one of the really cool things about doing it this way is previously, and I'll probably overlay a um, the previous tutorial of Nakama where this is showing that we were doing 120 RPCs per second, right? And even if we minimize that, like we did with this, where we have the, the lerping and things like that, it still ended up being something like 20 or, or 15 RPCs per second. But because we're doing it with WebRTC and we're making a direct connection, we don't need to worry about hitting our server as much. And that's one of the big advantages to this system is that we don't need to actually hit our server as much. So your server could be scaled to be a much smaller system. The nice thing about this is I was running into an issue when I released this tutorial a month ago, people were crashing my server because there were so many people playing on it at once that it actually took the server down because I didn't have a big enough server. But because this is WebRTC, you guys are only hitting the server for matchmaking capabilities, not for the actual gameplay itself reducing your overall load on your server. So that's one of the huge advantages for this. And our next big test at this point is to test with somebody on a fully different network. Because right now it works with me on my network locally and remotely, but we need to test it with somebody out in a different state or a different you know network. So I'm gonna call one of my uh, people that I work with and I'm gonna have them boot the game up and see if we can have a conversation. So I'll be right back. Now you will see that we both are connected. So we're both going to click ready. So I'll click ready. He's going to click ready. And you will see that we are now playing remotely. So if he moves his mouse and I move my mouse, you can see how that works. 
So you can kind of move it around and I also can move around and it just works, which is awesome. Sweet. So what technology do you guys like better? If you guys have seen my other Nakamo tutorial, I would love to know what you guys think. Do you think WebRTC is better or do you think having more of a server centric solution is better? Let me know because I'd love to hear from you guys. But that is all I have for you guys today. So if you like this video, please hit that like button. And hey, if you dislike this video, go ahead and hit that dislike button because I am here to make content for you guys. This video, as with all of my videos, was a viewer suggested video. So please, if you have any suggestions, throw them in the comments below and I'll be more than happy to take a look at it and add it to my Trello board. Links in the description for that. And hey, if you have any questions or comments about Nakama and WebRTC, let me know either in the comments or you can jump on the Discord. Links in the description and any of the guys on the Discord will be more than happy to help you out with any of your problems. But that is all I have for you guys today. So thank you so much again for watching and i will see you all next time thanks